Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Green Tech Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Green Tech Today, the Twit Network's top 25 Green Tech Innovators series. This episode of Green Tech Today is brought to you by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to view and comment on ideas, go to ecomagination.com forward slash challenge. And by Carbonite. Backing up the files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial, plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com, offer code GREENTECH. Algae. The word probably elicits images of scum-covered ponds rather than clean fuels for jets and cars, wrinkle-reducing skin serums, and heart-healthy foods. The truth is, we might be looking at an algae-powered future if companies like South San Francisco's Solazyme have anything to do with it. Founded in 2003, Solazyme produces oil from algae using a technique called indirect photosynthesis bioproduction, in which the algae are fed waste biomass, or non-food plants. The end result? Clean, renewable, domestically produced fuels. Today, we're taking a look at Solazyme's R&D facility and talking with the founder, one of the founders, about the future of algae. This is Jonathan Wilson the CEO. Could you tell me what Solazyme does? At its simplest level, Solazyme makes renewable oil. Okay. So we make oils to replace anything that you could make from petroleum or from vegetable oils. So if you think about petroleum, we make oils to replace fuels or plastics. Mm -hmm. And if you think about vegetable oils, we make oils to replace biodiesel or soap and even food cooking and frying oils. Okay, what are all the different oils or different products that you're working on? They're all from an algae base, right? Yeah, they are, and we can talk about algae because algae ultimately is the star of the show in a way. It's what actually produces the oil for us, but ultimately what we focus on is producing oils that are ideal for each of these markets. You can love your science, but your science better have a commercial application. And so the oils are really dedicated to entering the following markets, biofuels, which is where we really started. But what, what ended up happening is we found that if we were making oil, it could go into any of the things you use oil for today. So also chemicals, oleochemicals, food oils, foods, and even cosmetics. And so we actually have face creams that are made with algae-derived oils. And all of these different products, do they all come from one type of algae? No, and that uh, we're actually standing in a strain room right now where you have, I don't know, at least hundreds, uh, maybe thousands, I'm not sure what's in here exactly, <laughs> of uh, different, uh, uh, some are different genus and species and some are just different strains that can produce completely different oils. And they can produce oils that are different, that are beneficial for different kinds of applications. What made algae the direction to go when you were coming up with an idea for a company that you wanted, you wanted to found, you and your scientific co-founder, Harrison? Why algae? Well, essentially it's because algae is the original oil producer on the planet, right? It, all plants evolved from algae, which is actually a single-celled plant. And algae had this really strong evolutionary reasons to make oil. One of them was that when algae first appeared two or three million years ago, most of the planet was water. And yet they were photosynthetic, so they wanted sunlight. And if they wanted sunlight and they were in the water, then they wanted to float. And if they wanted to float, then they could accumulate something lighter than water, like oil, help them float. And another is because they're single-celled again, and they can't control their whereabouts. 
So even if you're thinking about a swamp or a beach, they could get washed up under a rock and not have access to that sun for a period of time. Right, so survival. So for survival, yeah. they developed this incredible ability to make and store oil for energy for that time when they didn't have access to sunlight. And it turns out that you can look at those things as evolutionary things, but the very practical result is that you drove here today, and whatever you drove in was fueled with a, a fuel that came from a barrel of oil, and there's a very good chance that some of that oil originated with algae. So algae actually... Millions of years ago. Millions of years ago, yeah. and so the fact is, it's actually proven that some of our oil reserves originated with ancient algal blooms. And so what our focus was is, hey, they have these fantastic evolutionary reasons to make oil. Now how do we capture that capability and shorten it for millions of years to a few days? You mentioned water being a big, a, and we all, we all know, think of algae on top of a pond or a mm -hmm. lake. Um, water is becoming scarcer and scarcer. How does your uh, process deal with water use? So actually that's a, a good question and just to explain a little bit about our process, it isn't the process most people think about when they think about algae. When they think about algae they might think about big ponds out in the desert or uh, some kinds of bags filled with algae out in the sun. We actually grow our algae in the dark and we grow our algae in big stainless steel tanks and what we do is we actually feed our algae different kinds of plant materials. And, and, and the algae actually eat those plant materials and convert them into oil. And they do it very rapidly and in just a few days. One of the interesting parts about our technology is that we use a wide variety of different kinds of plant material to feed the algae. And one of the really important benefits of that is we can look for different kinds of plants that don't require a lot of excess water. That's great. Now, since 2003, you've been growing and growing and growing, and really, Solozyme seems to be developing as the leader in this area of alg algal biofuels. Um, is it the process, the production process that you've developed, the, the fermentation tanks, not having the open pools that's been a part of that? We realized that the algae were wonderful at turning plant sugars into oil. Mm -hmm. But what we also realized after a period of time when we were actually scaled up in big ponds was, you know, the algae really, for the same reasons they're really good at making oil, they're actually not so good at working together to harvest sunlight over a given area. And so we have to look for other kinds of plant matter that can more economically, efficiently produce plant sugar and biomass. And if we split the process up, we can take all these other kinds of plants and feed them to the algae, and we can also then get to use this pre-existing infrastructure of industrial fermentation. And I would tell you that the willingness to be wrong and to change course and to split the process is really what differentiates us and what's allowed us to produce quantities, I believe, far in excess of anyone else in the world. The way we look at the world is it's not our job here to replace petroleum. It's our, you know, this is a, a problem that requires silver buckshot, not a silver bullet and we're part of that buckshot. So we focus on the parts of the puzzle that there aren't better technologies to replace. We can make a worldwide impact, but it's not our job to fix all of the problems. It's to address a very meaningful subset, and that's what we do. Okay. Well, when we come back, we're going to take a tour of Solozyme's facilities. I'm looking forward to it, and maybe even getting a tasty treat at the end. We're partnering with uh, four of the, the biggest uh, venture capital firms in the clean energy space, three in the U.S., one in Europe. Uh, you know, again, we think that the combination of GE investment and venture capital investment is going to allow us to increase innovation. It's going to allow us to accelerate new ideas. It puts us shoulder to shoulder with some of the smartest tech investors. And we can use the, what I would call the industrial clout of GE to bring technologies to this marketplace faster. GE announced its challenge at a San Francisco event along with its four venture capital partners. Emerald Technology Ventures, Foundation Capital, Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers, and Rockport Capital Partners have all joined with GE. Ideas from companies and individuals can be entered through the ecoimagination.com website for the next 10 weeks. So check out ecoimagination.com.
using algae to put the power of the sun into our fuel tanks. We're starting our tour right now. What is the room that we're in? Well, you're in a strain room. We have a number of these uh, around the company, but what you're looking at is you're, you're in a room surrounded by different strains of algae. Uh -huh. Some of them come from different genus. Some are just different species. You can see different colors, different looks. And what we're doing here is we're actually looking for algae that can produce different types of oils. So it may be an oil that's a highly nutritious, unsaturated, heart-healthy edible oil, mm -hmm. or an oil that you could send into a refinery to get a very high yield of jet fuel, right? And so actually there are different strains in this room that we're testing against for everything from diesel fuel, jet fuel, to the perfect soap, to the perfect frying oil, to an oil that would go great into a cosmetic to put on your face. Okay, what's going on with the shakers behind you? Is this part of the, uh, the process of growing the algae? In certain cases, we may be engineering different strains somewhere to, to, to try to get them to make a perfect oil to make a jet fuel. Mm -hmm. And then what we need to do usually is we want to grow them up at least to a slightly larger volume like this, where we might actually then extract the oil and test it for its intended purpose. So there might not be enough oil on this plate for us to really do a substantial test, so we might go to something like this. Okay. And you, t you talked earlier about the different feedstocks. Do you have any of the examples of the feedstocks in this room as I do. Well? I do. Take a look at that. We, uh, and, and, and there are many more that aren't in this room also. But just as an example, I mean, what you're looking at here, um, this tar-like substance is a, a glycerol that came out of a biodiesel plant. Okay, so when you make biodiesel, you end up with kind of a pseudo waste co-product, glycerol, and that's one from one biodiesel plant, and that's one from another. <laughs> I, <laughs> Looks love, delightful. I love the idea of that because biodiesel many times is coming from waste products mm -hmm. to begin with, so mm -hmm. then you're getting the waste product from the biodiesel production and continuing the process. Yeah, so it's actually a closed loop cycle. We feed this right back to the algae and they convert this into oil that then goes back into the biodiesel process. So those are glycerol, but you know, here's another example which actually doesn't look anything like what it is. <laughs> what, what, what I'm holding here actually is a cellulosic, uh, a cellulosic sugar uh, from uh, municipal green waste. So essentially, yard clippings, leaves, and golf course cuttings that are broken down with some acid and then fed to the algae. And I know it doesn't look like a, 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 a thing full of leaves and, and, uh, and, le and yard clippings. <laughs> but it is. But it is. Okay, I trust you. <laughs> and the algae actually, the neat thing about them is they're plants and they're really tolerant of all the contaminants in that breakdown material and they grow quite well on it. That's neat. So some of the products that you've got here, um, the soap is, is one of the big stories. You've got a partnership with which company? For the Unilever. Unilever. And so you're working with some of the oil, algal oils to develop soap products. Yeah, so this is a bar of soap um, that was made in, uh, I believe it was made in a Unilever facility uh, in a pilot run, but it's a bar of soap that was made with algal oil. Uh, to replace some of the other kinds of oil, like palm oil, for instance. And one of the interests is in, in producing algal oils for soaps because you can produce sustainable oils this way, and sometimes it's hard for big companies to be able to control their supply sources for things like palm, and they may end up unintentionally using non-sustainably grown palm that might come from you know, pulling down a rainforest, right. for instance. As opposed to knowing that it came from algae in one particular fermentation plant That's in right. one location, That's right. that you know what feedstocks You are know what the whole life it. cycle is and the sustainability footprint. That's right. Nice. One of uh, the other things that I've heard recently is the advancement in skin serum. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Is it going to going to help the wrinkles for? <laughs> well, you don't have any, first of all. But but second of all, if you did, um, yeah, this is a compound that we actually discovered. It was kind of one of those happy mistakes while we were doing the work to look at different kinds of oil, and we realized that some of the strains were making these really unique polysaccharides, which one of our, our, our chief of genetics, who also runs a pretty big lab down at Stanford, said you need to test these materials for their skin care. Uh, 
effects. And so we produced enough of them early on, just enough of them, and sent them out to testing labs and came back with incredible results for things like skin moisture retention, uh, collagen stimulation, elastin stimulation, even wrinkle reduction. So um, they're now being formulated into a number of different products. Uh, we've started to sell a little bit this year yes. and are expecting some pretty big launches next year with some big cosmetic partners. All right. Well, this is an interesting room and I love, I love all the algae spinning in the background, but I know there's a lot more around here. So can we go take a look at the rest of the labs? Sure, okay. sure, sure. So tell me what goes on generally in these lab areas. Well, a lot of things go on in these lab areas. We're actually standing in a molecular biology lab here. So this is a place where some strains that we bring in from the outside will make their first appearance. <laughs> this is where they say hello to the Solozyme employees, where we look at them. Sometimes what we do is we'll genotype them so we understand whether or not they are what we think they are. Sometimes it turns out that we'll get a strain in that we believe is of a certain type. And once we look at its genetic code, we find out it's something completely different. And it's important for us to characterize them because it helps us understand what kinds of oil they might make, how fast and efficiently they might make oil, um, whether they are going to grow well in a fermentation vessel, and you know whether, frankly, whether they're going to be good for a food application or a chemical application. So uh, we'll look at that. And then some of these molecular biology labs here are also labs where we'll take some of the chemical and fuel strains and we'll optimize them through modification to make better oils or faster oils. Okay, taking a, a walk down here, this is, a, this is a big lab. I know you just moved in here this year mm -hmm. recently and from your beginnings, humble beginnings in a garage, I'm sure this has changed a lot. Yes. And it's quite something to, to understand that there are all these absolutely brilliant people hard at work in here to commercialize this technology. I mean, that's one of the most gratifying things. When, when new people start mm -hmm. and they come to the bench and you look at their backgrounds and what they've accomplished before and realize that all that energy is going into you know, commercializing our process, it, it's a great feeling. And it's very different. I mean, look, our, our, the garage was the size of that freezer over there, <laughs> and that's where the whole thing started. And, and now there's you know, over 100 people who are dedicated every day to commercializing this technology. And it's totally growing. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest challenges to taking the technology from the lab to production? So, I mean, <laughs> the greatest challenges are taking the technology from the lab <laughs> to production, right? Okay, right. And, and, and I, I, I'm not trying to be glib, but it, you know. So we've built a, a, a phenomenal, uh, we call them the process development and scale up team. And their job is to take a lot of the really amazing work that might go on in, in shake flasks or, or, or beakers in here and to scale them up in large commercial equipment. And what it requires is people who have been commercially producing uh, chemicals and, and biopharmaceuticals and all kinds of things at very large scale for decades. And you've got to bring together all these different capabilities. This is where you go from a room full of molecular biologists to a room full of engineers and chemical engineers, right? right. And, and it's you know, the other problem challenge, I would say, is you, you have to get these phenomenal engineers and chemical engineers who are willing to spend weeks at a time on the road because the scale of the equipment that we use to demonstrate commercial production is, I mean, the fermenters that we use are taller than this whole building, right? And they're, they were built, you know, decades ago for some other purpose and they're in Pennsylvania or they're in Iowa or they're in Illinois or in Southern California and the people that work on those scale-up teams are on the road, some of them 90% of the time. All right, speaking of being on the road, I'm a little hungry. I think we should head down to the food lab. Awesome. This episode of Green Tech Today is brought to you by Carbonite, the leader in online backup. Unexpected computer disasters happen all the time. Some of the most common problems I hear about are hard drive failures and viruses. The end result of all this? We risk losing the important files on our computers. Things like your photos, videos, music, Word and Excel documents that would be so hard to live without. 
From Carbonite.com, you can have unlimited backup for your PC or Mac for only $55 a year. That's just 15 cents a day. Try it for free. Go to Carbonite.com, enter the offer code GREENTECH. If you decide to buy the service after your free trial, you'll get two months free with the offer code GREENTECH. So tell me about the Food Lab. This is a new new endeavor for Solazyme. Yeah, reasonably new. Yeah. Um, we've been at it for at least two or three years already, but that still makes it new compared to fuels and some of the other things we've been working on. What we realized was we're making oils, and we initially were targeting to make the ideal biodiesel. Right. And we went to all these biodiesel plants and said, tell us what kind of oil we should make. And they told us what kind of oil, an exact oil profile. So we started making that oil, and then somebody noticed that that oil profile had the exact same oil profile as olive oil. So then it led to, okay, we have to taste Ooh, this should stuff. Should we cook, cook with it? Should exactly. we taste it? Yeah. Exactly. So that was really the start. We realized we were making a brand new, highly heart healthy, unsaturated, edible oil. We didn't know it was edible at first, but obviously we, we, we figured that out, we <laughs> tested it, and then um, we went through a regulatory process with it, and then we started to cook, and we realized we had a completely new kind of oil and oil-based materials that we could use to replace things like eggs, oil, and butter in cooking. Now, I'll give you an example, right? So here we have, uh, we have a chocolate cookie over here, and somewhere is a nutritional panel for that cookie right back there. So these are, these are sugar cookies, okay? Mm -hmm. And versus a control, you're reducing your calories 25%, your fat 75%, your saturated fat 100%, Wow. your cholesterol 100%, and you're adding dietary fiber. And dietary fiber is always important for being able to slow down digestion and absorb important nutrients. Yep, and heart health. And heart health. Cholesterol, so go ahead and try it. Okay. That's pretty good. Well, about for an, for an algae cookie, I, don't, I didn't know what to expect really, but it's pretty good. About 10% of that cookie there's algae and <laughs> if you want to really understand it even better no butter no eggs if you want to understand it no butter no eggs if you want to understand it even better take a little tiny taste of the flour that was made with it's thick mm -hmm. wow but mm -hmm. it doesn't have a flavor you would ever associate with flavor. that. Yeah. Mm -mm. So um, here's another thing that's a really, really wonderful thing to try. I don't know if you like honey mustard. I love it. Okay. Try one of those, and com I'll, I'll compare this honey mustard after you try it. I'll tell you what's different about this honey mustard than a standard honey mustard. That's good. Move from Ooh. here, from honey mustard and cookies, to things like ice cream. Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Going from renewable fuels, renewable oils, suddenly we have biodiesel, we have skin creams, skin serums, soaps, and cookies and honey mustard. Mm -hmm. It's pretty okay. amazing. It's a new source of oil to replace all the things that we use oil for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Real pleasure. Biology, genetics, Chemistry, science makes Solazyme the leader in renewable fuels and bioproducts. I'm Dr. Kiki and I'm done green hunting for this week. Catch me someplace else next time. That's it for this episode of Green Tech Today. Subscribe at twit.tv forward slash GTT and never miss a show. If you have a question or a comment, email us at greentechtoday at twit.tv. Or you can leave a voicemail at 415-GT-TODAY. <laughs>